Welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I am here with my co-host, the creator and founder of Genetic Insights and Feel Younger, Elwyn Robinson. And today, Elwyn, you wanted to tell me about a new approach to thyroid issues that we haven't discussed before. So tell me, why did you want to talk about this topic today? Uh, well, as I said before we started recording, Chrissy, um, it seems like every client I speak to, I have to explain to them over and over again this potential approach to thyroids that, and in fact their overall health, which can really help them. So I said, let's get an episode about it done ASAP. Uh, this is not something that I'm in t that you know is entirely new to me. I I very rarely like discover something one week and then do an episode about it the next. I always want to have time to both research and test on myself and at least a few people close to me, and that's exactly what I've done. But it is still fairly new to me. I have to admit. I also want to give a shout out to uh, a client and you know long time friend called Wendy who first uh, alerted me to this perhaps being an approach which was worth investigating. I'll be honest to begin with. I pretty much brushed it off because I had so many other things to do, but eventually my intuition was like, all right, I, you know, I, I need to check this out, and um, and it was a very good recommendation. So what are we talking about? As you know, on this podcast, we talked a lot about thyroid, and I think certainly, you know, some people who follow me come from one school of thought and some from the other and whatever, but I think all of those schools of thought do agree that the thyroid and the metabolism is very important. The only uh, thing maybe where they disagree is exactly how to address that, but we all understand that. So I won't spend too long talking about the importance of the thyroid, and of course we did a whole episode on that before, as well as, you know, several other episodes we talked about it, but I thought maybe just a, a very brief summary to talk about why the thyroid is so important, and then we'll quickly get into this fundamentally different approach to addressing the thyroid. Just before I get into that, let's maybe talk about the the headline, the highlights, the selling point or whatever as to why you might be interested in this system, especially if you're already having some kind of thyroid uh, medication, support or whatever, and you feel like you're really doing pretty well. The reason why this is important and potentially something worth learning about, even if you think you're doing well, is because it is a different approach, which first of all, um, I would say has a lot more of a potential for quick resolution of symptoms than the other approach, the approach that I've outlined before in uh, earlier episodes. And second of all, and I'd say more importantly, the traditional approach to thyroid is that you know, unless nutritional and detoxification and other strategies work, but, you know, very often you actually have to have glandular support or medication support, and then pretty much you have to stay on that if you want to get better. Now, you don't have to stay on it, you can always stop, but, you know, usually if you stop, the symptoms will come back again, like nothing is resolved per se. And so the uh, potentially amazing thing about this is that the, the promise is that at least in most cases, a person, if they do this approach, it still involves uh, utilizing real thyroid hormone, not just some supplement or something, but it's doing it with a specific strategy where the goal is actually ultimately to no longer need it. So to restore yourself to an optimal state of functioning and then like wean yourself off it. And the person who has come up with this um, particular procedure uh, known as Dr. Dennis Wilson, um, and the uh, the system is called Wilson's Temperature Syndrome, he named it after himself, um, he gives quite extensive guidance. He has a doctor's manual like for doctors to use where he kind of talks about how to wean people off and if it doesn't work the first time, like what to do. And, you know, if then, he has, I think even a flow chart like to eventually help people to do that. But he acknowledges it doesn't always work first time, but it is ultimately the goal of it. So to a lot of people who don't want to be stuck having to take something for the rest of their life, especially something that requires a prescription, that seems to be, you know, highly appealing as well. Yeah, I mean, the, you make a really great point there because usually when somebody's on a medication, that's it for life and they have to, you know, rely on that for so on and so forth. And sometimes those medications can have side effects. So what I'm hearing from you is that this new approach from Wilson's temperature uh, method syndrome, or what, did, what was it? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Wilson's temperature syndrome is the uh, issue, and then uh, I don't know if he's got a name for his kind of methods right, to resolve right, right. it. But yeah, yeah but that m method, which is hopefully 
potentially giving people, you know, a way out to maybe let go of the medication um, at the end result, maybe. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, many medications are temporary, I guess, like antibiotics and stuff like that. But I, I agree, like hormonal medications, hormonal replacement medications are usually a case of, yeah, you can stop, but you're going <laughs> to feel as bad as you did before at best. And you might <laughs> right. actually feel worse because yeah. of th down regulation. So, yeah, that's quite uh, original, not original, quite unique about the system. Do you want to go over really what the, you know, the role of the thyroid here is that we can give everybody? I know we've done a, a couple of episodes more on that but just a brief overview for because it really is super important yeah so what i'll actually do is answer that question maybe not in the typical way but in the way that wilson himself will do it and just to say i did try inviting him onto this podcast a couple of times i never heard back so i don't know if it's because he doesn't want to do podcasts or if the person monitoring his email <laughs> didn't pass it on to him I, I can't say exactly but i just thought in the end you know what I think I understand it plenty now. Uh, I've got experience of it as well. So I'll just speak at it from that point of view. If we can get him on one day to actually uh, talk about how he developed it and stuff like that, then I think that would be really good as well. Yeah, so this, so anyway. is, this is your invitation if you're listening. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, definitely reach out to us. We'd love to have you on. So it's actually not Wilson's thyroid syndrome. It's Wilson's temperature syndrome. That is an interesting and crucial distinction, even though thyroid is really at the center of, you know, both the problem and the solution that he offers. So what does that mean? So let's start with uh, putting temperature at the forefront of everything, at the forefront of health. So we as mammals are warm-blooded creatures. That's one of the things that separates us. What does that mean? It means that... Um, Despite the ambient temperature around us, we will stay at a very consistent temperature. That's not true for fish. That's not true for reptiles. Um, it's not true for you know most other organisms out there. It's in fact what separates mammals specifically, um, or one of the things that separates mammals. Um, and to achieve that is very, very difficult. It requires a lot of energy to maintain the specific temperature usually higher than ambient although sometimes lower as well but it requires a lot of energy to keep us at this specific temperature and this specific temperature that is optimal for the functioning of the body is 37 degrees if you are the rest of the world and 98.6 if you are american and so i'm going to try and remember each time to give both versions chrissy but you can uh, uh, point it out if i forget sometimes so uh so that level is perfect. Why is it perfect? Because, so we've talked about this before, every function in the body is dependent on these things called enzymes. Most of us, if we've heard the word enzyme at all, we might think of digestion, and there are certainly digestive enzymes, but enzymes are actually way broader than that. Enzymes are really little um, chemical transformation factories. That's how I like to look at them anyway. So enzyme is responsible for taking one thing and turning them into another thing. That's the, the crucial thing of what they do. And so as you can imagine, even if you have no biochemistry knowledge, there's a lot of that going on <laughs> in the body. Uh, there's a lot of turning one thing into another thing in order to keep all of this working. And so a lot of the function of enzyme is down to ultimately, just like with many machines, down to the uh, speeds of its functioning. So, one, so there are kind of dysfunctional ways that an enzyme can function, which are kind of aberrations and exceptions. But mostly, when we're talking about enzyme function, we're talking about is it functioning uh, slowly? Is, isn't it functioning too slowly? Is it functioning quickly? Is it functioning too quickly? Or is it functioning at an optimal rate? for given the context, given what is required in that specific moment. And so in order for us mammals to have those enzymes function in an optimal level, the, for the majority of contexts, we want to be at the specific temperature of 37 or 98.6. That's what allows these enzymes to function at an optimal level. Now, there are exceptions to this, of course. One is well known and well understood, and one not so much. And it's the not so much one that's crucially important that we're going to be focused on. But let's talk about the one that's better known. So, Chrissy, I know you had a fever recently. 
Uh, how did you know you had a fever? What temperature did you get up to? I got up to 100, 101, kind of, it, it started off low grade, probably about 99, and I was like, oh, okay. And then, it, yeah, it went, it peaked at about 101. And when it was 100, were you feeling pretty not good, would you say? I, yeah, it was. it's funny, this one, because usually when I have that fever, I the headache is usually the first clue that I have the fever. This one was a little bit different. I was just like, no, I need to be in bed. I'm done. I've just, I just need to need to do nothing and I had absolutely no appetite at all mm. okay uh, maybe pain discomfort of some kind yeah just kind of like ugh, you know that that rundown achy just not great feeling okay and you had that at 100 degrees mm -hmm. that's the yes okay so that's a crucial thing and that's typical right so we all know if we're supposed to be 98.6 if we get up to 100 that's a sign that there's a problem right the equivalent for us rest of the welders we're supposed to be 37. If we're up to about 37.7, that's a sign of a problem, right? Does that make sense? And you go to a doctor, they will validate that. Probably if you're 100, 37.7, they're also going to say it's not such a big deal. Don't worry about it. Just go home, rest and drink fluids. It's not an emergency. But they wouldn't argue that's a sign that there's something wrong. That's a sign that you probably have an infection, maybe something else, but they're probably going to assume infection until proven otherwise. Okay. And... So why does your body do that to you? It does that as a necessary response to, I'd say most commonly either an infection, but also I see it with poisoning. So if you have been infected with something, if you've been poisoned with something, there's a lot of overlap between those because one of the main issues with being having a pathogenic organism start to proliferate is that they create lots of uh, um, poison as a byproduct of their proliferation, which... Uh, you know, has a has that effect on the body. And so anyway, to deal with that poison and to deal with that infection, the body has to speed up a bunch of its different processes. And that slight variation in temperature from 37 to 37.7 or from 98.6 to 100 massively increases the speed that all of these detoxif detoxification enzymes are processing out and that the immune system is functioning out. Like it's way, 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 way more effective. I've seen different estimates of that, but something like five or 10 times as effective the immune system is with just that, you know, increase. Now the immune system, a big part of the immune system, uh, especially the initial response to the immune system to either a poison or an infection is an inflammatory response. And that's where we get all the classic symptoms of being ill. Some people might show up more sore throat, some people cough, some people, you know, whatever, in the case of respiratory infection. Uh, but, you know, there'll be certain signs, as you said, like aching, tiredness, um, you know, headache that are pretty much universal. Okay. So all of that's a given, no one would argue with it. Now, here's the thing. What about... In fact, before I go to the next thing, does that make sense? Any questions on that, Chris? No, that makes absolute sense. I mean, yeah, and another thing, like, you could feel these were, like, mm, really increased in size. So it's like, I know my body's trying to deal with something here. Yeah. So if it's excessive, that's the problem. It has a tendency to escalate. And if it is uh, deficient, then that is pretty rare. However, that is from a medical perspective where the main thing is to kind of do no harm. And unfortunately, what that's morphed into these days is uh, not be liable for, you know, something that you might be sued for or just, you know, killing someone. I'm sure it doesn't feel very good knowing that you could have done something to prevent that. But less of a focus on this patient of mine is suffering. They've got all of these chronic health issues. And honestly, you know, this is a controversial thing to say, but a lot of the chronic issues that actually do end up taking people out may well be connected to these issues, although we may or may not get to that. But anyway, let's just focus on quality of life for a second. So what are some classic signs of low temperature? Wilson lists them. Feeling cold, you know, is an obvious one. This is not 100% uh, a guaranteed um, indicator Sometimes the perception of your body's temperature is off, but overall, people complain about being cold often. Yeah, you cold know. hands, cold feet, things like that, yeah. Well, cold hands, cold feet specifically are more a sign of high adrenaline, um, but more it's more like if the person I'm with, they're in a T-shirt and I'm like trying to get a jacket kind of thing, that's more of an indicator. Um, so feeling cold, low energy, or and or needing stimulants in order to have energy, which is really, you know, low energy. 
Uh, depression is a, a pretty reliable indicator. I used to be more careful about that, but the more I research it, the more convinced I am. Uh, just as an example, I saw a study the other day that um, out of people who were diagnosed with uh, medium or uh, severe depression, 93% of them had low levels of T3. And T3 is a thyroid hormone that we're going to talk about soon. And the effectiveness of T3 therapy at reversing depression is, again, much better than antidepressants. So I'm confident enough these days to say that there's so much evidence behind I was gonna that. Say, let's just, yeah, that's a big statement to say right there because it's like, well, what, what if this is so severely overlooked and people aren't doing it and they're just prescribing all these other med medicines for depression? But really, here's, the, here's your, your ultimate issue. So, so this could change so much for some people. It could, and I'll get back to why it's so important when we talk about what T3 is. But yeah, I'll just carry on listing the temperature thing for a second. So uh, depression, stress is a different potential response, and I'll talk about why some people do one, some people the other, and some people go back and forth. Uh, weight issues, most commonly gaining weight, but some people, like me, maybe 20% of people is the opposite, is can't gain weight, that also happens. Digestive issues in general, um, whether it's uh, you know acid reflux, whether it's uh, diarrhea, constipation though is more often, uh, infections of the small intestine, that kind of stuff that we talked about. Dry skin is a common one. Low sex drive and or low function. I see more low sex drive in women, see more low sex function in men. Uh, uh, allergies, chronic infections. Wilson doesn't talk about this, but I see toxin sensitivity. So people, you know, to whom anything toxic, they have a much stronger reaction to it than the average person. Uh, whether that's, you know, chemicals in cleaning products or, you know, uh, in, in um, skin care products and all that kind of stuff. Not that any of those things are good, but just having a stronger reaction to it. More hypersensitive in a way. More hypersensitive. And, you know, I've got uh, Wilson's book here, I mean, like he's got a big list on the cover, uh, decreased memory concentration, unhealthy nails, low motivation and ambition, irritable bowel syndrome, dry skin and hair, oh yeah, insomnia, asthma, hives, etc, etc. I mean, the list goes on. And in fact, a big section of this book called Wilson's Temperature Syndrome, uh, unsurprisingly, is uh, dedicated to him just going through a huge list of all kinds of common health, chronic health issues that usually doctors either don't help or give you something to suppress the symptoms but don't actually resolve, uh, but often just dismiss entirely and how they're all related to this low temperature issue. So again, different symptoms, right? We talked about the symptoms of the temperature being too high. These are the most common symptoms of the temperature being too low. Just like with the temperature symptoms being too high, as you said, sometimes it manifests for you in this way, sometimes it manifests for you in a different way, but it, there's certain things that it tends to be. And so the same thing with the low temperature syndrome, there's certain things that it tends to be. Um, and I'll explain exactly why it's those kind of symptoms when we talk about the mechanism behind it. Uh, let me ask you this, Ellen, why would the body's temperature be decreasing? Why would it, why would it be so low and, and slow? Yeah, of course, because we said, you know, in the case of it being too high, it's usually an infection and or a poisoning. Um, so why would it be too low? That is the million dollar question. And there's um, good reasons for this. So as we said, 98.6 or 37 is optimal function. Given that that's optimal function, why does the body sometimes choose to increase the metabolism, raise the temperature? Why does the body sometimes choose to decrease the metabolism and lower the temperature? We already talked about the raise the temperature. Why does it choose to lower the temperature? So there's a few reasons for this. Um, one of them, and this is probably the primary one, is because there is not enough food or the body believes there is not enough food. So if, you've, if you think about most ma mammals. No, yeah, I was going to say, is that something that we're putting ourselves into? Or is it that natural process that in our inherent nature, there's some mechanism there that the body's trying to sort out or, or do? Uh, so it could be either. So if you choose to fast, if you choose to not eat, or if you choose to periodically not eat, or even if you just choose to restrict your calories, the body doesn't know that you're doing that on purpose. It just thinks there's not enough food. It assumes that that's the reason why you're doing it. Because if we look at most mammals, um, sorry, if we look at all mammals, 
like being able to get enough food is always like a top priority, maybe along with reproduction and not being hunted, right? And so for the herbivores, the being able to get enough food is, you know, they often spend most of their waking life eating, chewing. Uh, if we look at the predators, um, they spend a lot more time resting, but they, let's say, expend most of their energy trying to get food in the form of hunting and, and, and um, stalking and all that kind of behavior. So getting food, getting enough food is a big preoccupation. And this is correct because often there isn't enough food. For a predator, I think, you know, nine times out of 10, when they try and hunt an animal, they fail. There's a, there's a constant threat of hunger because you literally have to kill something else that desperately, you know, wants to get away or wants to fight you back. Um, and in the case of the herbivore, of course, that's, it's less of a, an issue that, that like starvation is less around the corner than it feels like for a predator but still it's you know always an issue uh, depending on the situation uh there's always a the potential that you're gonna there's gonna be a drought there's gonna be a whatever pestilence something and, and there's not going to be enough food so the mammal always has to be ready to down regulate the metabolism in response to there not being enough food and in fact even it could potentially even be not enough nutrition so I would say if you're going on a ketogenic diet or so you don't think I'm picking on you, maybe the opposite, like a fruitarian or a high carb diet, the body might, but to be honest, it's more true of a ketogenic diet. The body might go, oh, there's a lack of, you know, all nutrients. You know, we're used to having some of each and now suddenly there's none of this one. So it's still a little bit of a signal that there's something missing and that there's maybe something wrong. Um, there are other potential issues, and Wilson does talk about them, but I'm only going to mention one other big one because it's so crucial, um, and that is stress. Mm. So, oh, that pesky word stress that's prevalent <laughs> in absolutely everything. <laughs> yes. And stress, I mean, if we zoom out from starvation or lack of food, that's really just a type of stress anyway, if we think about it. So it's the most important one because... The one downside to having a fast metabolism is that you have to eat a lot in order to be able to maintain the fast metabolism. That doesn't sound like a downside, of course, in our modern age where most people are like trying to eat less and have an abundance of food available to them. But again, throughout most of history, having a fast metabolism was you know, a sign of priv privilege or luxury because most of the time there wouldn't be enough food or even if there was food, it would be, you know, not very nutritious maybe it would you know and i'm talking about most of the time maybe a civilization it depends what you believe about prehistory of you know, hunter gatherers or this or that but anyway for at least a few thousand years most of us were like serfs or peasants most of our ancestors and there was always like a lack of food and a lack of variety of food and not very nutritious food and a threat of being no food and in fact whether your ancestry had that food scarcity or not will affect things and we'll get we'll get to that uh, soon wilson does talk about that as well so when you're when you're uh, when you don't have enough food or when you have stress um when you're in a stressful situation your body down regulates even if there is an abundance of food even if you are eating a lot if you're even if you're you know comfort eating or whatever your body will still down regulate the metabolism because it assumes if you if your adrenaline is pumping your cortisol is pumping your heart rate is going all the rest of it if you're in a fight or flight state even if there's a load of food right now there may not be for very long right any minute you may have to run away from the soldiers run away from the tigers so the fight body, for your life okay so the body's equating that to an absolute survival state which therefore it doesn't realize that oh it's actually something else and there's still plenty of food so that is why because i was going to say why would it down regulate if there is plenty but it's that stress mechanism that's um switching that part on yes and it doesn't always down regulate so this is the other thing that i you know try and explain to people so i mean it does, but sometimes there's like a false high temperature. So let me explain that. So the most obvious thing that the body can do if it perceives a lack of food and or an excess of stress is to go into a conservation mode, right? Let me conserve the energy that I have available to me. Let me reduce my intake needs. Um, and let me just kind of, you know, like with uh, electronic equipment, you put it in standby mode. So it's not doing anything in terms of output, but it's it's still there. You can switch it on at any moment, but it's it's just doing the minimal necessary while staying awake, 
if you put it that way. So the most extreme version of like a conservation mode or a standby mode would be like a hibernation, right? Where you're outright just basically, you know, everything slows down a lot. That's one of the things about hibernating bears or whatever. Uh, their metabolism slows down a lot. And that's how they can spend months without eating or, or doing anything, moving or whatever, and still stay alive. Um, is because they've slowed their metabolism down so much. So humans don't hibernate, but we do some of us do that slow down mode. And so that kind of person, they tend to be slow in every sense of the world. So they tend to be cold, they tend to be overweight, they, their thinking tends to be slow, their movement tends to be slow, their movements tend to be slow. You know, if you're walking in front, they're walking in front of you in the hall, they might be like moving. I'm not talking about old people, I'm talking about maybe someone your age, but you know, they're just moving very slowly. They talk very slowly, they think very slowly. They act very slowly. They're slow to make decisions, you know, uh, et cetera. <laughs> and everything slows down. Also, the immune system slows down. The digestive system slows down. The cardiovascular system slows down. The respiratory system slows down. And on and on and on. Everything just slows down. When we're looking at this from the outside, we may say this is slowness. And the more, more extreme version, again, we may say this is depression. Going back to that depression thing. What do we say if someone has no desire to do anything? What do we say if someone says it's futile even getting out of bed? It's futile doing anything. Now, that's kind of like a philosophy, but, you know, everything is futile. What's the point? That kind of thing. So yeah. we, we turn it's that into the space. Yeah. Yeah. We turn that into a philosophy when we feel that way. But really, it's just rooted in a feeling. It's a feeling of nothing is worth doing. It's a feeling of uh, everything is pointless. But what if the feeling is only there? because of a switch that has gone on inside us on an unconscious level, which is says conservation mode time. We don't have enough energy. There, are, there is a relative lack of resources perceived, if not, you know, actually. And so we're just going to go into shutdown mode. So in that case, uh, so that's one option. Now, there's another option. And this is the type of person who I see more often, probably just because I'm that type of person. And that's the person who goes, you know what, I can't just shut down. People rely on me, there's things I want to do, there's things I have to do, you know, whatever. I have to, I have to keep going. But they're in conservation mode, their body wants to be in conservation mode. So how do they manage it? The only way to override that with the power of will or the Nietzschean stuff is to be adrenalized. And so these are the people who would tend to listen to personal development stuff and motivational seminars and maybe chicken soup for the soul and all that kind of thing. Like try and pump themselves up, you know, maybe, uh, you know, that kind of music, Eye of the Tiger, all that kind of stuff, like try, come across, like trying to build themselves up to get in there and do things. Or maybe on a less positive note, who will be scaring the crap out of themselves in order to get themselves to do stuff, right? Oh my God, if I don't get up, then I'm going to get fired and then this person's going to leave me and then my child's going to, you know, uh, be neglected and they're going to die. Blah, 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 blah. So it's either like a, a motivational drama or it's a horror film, like to, to get themselves to move. So in either case, I mean, you know, they're, they're different strategies. The, the positive one is probably uh, better than the, uh, the fear-based one. But what they both have in common is that they're highly adrenalized strategies. So they're like, let's use adrenaline to get out of this conservation mode and get stuff done. Now, the advantage of that is it works. A person like that can be a highly productive member of society. They can achieve a lot. They can help a lot of people. Um, they can... Um, yeah, be productive, I guess, which is the point. They can do stuff. But the challenge is that that's all they can do. And so that's because the when you are running on adrenal energy, there are certain thing there are certain systems in your body that will be operating near peak capacity, but there are other systems of your body that definitely won't be. So the systems of your body that will be working at peak capacity are, unsurprisingly, the survival systems. So we've got fight, flight, or freeze, and we're talking more about fight or flight, the active forms. So what are we talking about? We're talking about um, the cardiovascular system will probably still work at peak capacity for at least a while. The respiratory system, the muscular system, and also the, the, the brain, the, in, at least in the sense of being able to think clearly and focus. 
Not necessarily memory, though, uh, as I just read. That's the bit that does fail. Memory is less important from a survival point of view, um, unless it is, you know, things that might kill you memory, but certainly, you know, not, not facts and figures and stuff like that and stuff, experiences that people want to remember. Um, so what are some of the systems that are considered um, luxuries from a survival point of view? Things like the immune system, things like the um, sex hormones, which will give us testosterone and will give us progesterone and you know these kind of things that will actually dhea things that actually make us feel good right um and also give a sex drive we talked about the low sex drive um with the immune system that's where we see chronic infections and or allergies and intolerances and those kind of over reactions to things because the immune system isn't functioning optimally um, things like the digestive system gets down regulated so that's where we see digestive issues that's where we constipation is the most typical one because it's just the whole peristalsis system of moving food through is just simply slowed down when the metabolism is slowed down um we see if you're in a conservation mode, uh, again, people go two different ways, especially if they're highly adrenalized, but often they will either put on weight or they will uh, they'll put on fat or they will struggle to keep on any weight, including muscle. So they tend, you tend to either be very thin or you tend to be overweight with excess fat. Um, I would say the excess fat is more common when people are in the true conservation mode and the being too thin is more common when people are in the true adrenal mode but especially over time uh, you know a lot of people get both and that's where the skinny fat phenomenon comes in um, so over time eventually you know most people do end up putting on the fat because other stress chemicals start to build up like estrogen for instance um, yeah, and we talked about depression and mood and that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, memory, that would be another example. That's a luxury. And so, you know, when I talk to these people, and I talk to a lot of them like over and over again, all of these things, you know, they tend to have all of these issues because these are all the things that are considered luxuries from the adrenal point of view, if from, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, from a survival, in that moment of absolute survival, those things are not necessary. We don't need the energy for those things. It's not, they're not necessary to be at peak functioning. They can be on like a standby functioning still doing it but so basically those enzymes that control you know as i said muscles and uh heart rate and lung function and the stuff that's required to fight or run away they can still be at peak efficiency at least after you've had a cup of coffee and got yourself stressed but you can't do the same thing with your immune system or your digestive system you can't peak that by built you know by uh, stressing yourself out in fact you'll just suppress it even more and that's where Often those are the kind of areas, or skin, that's another one, skin health. That's why those are the kind of areas that people often start to develop issues. Uh, so does that make sense so far? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So those are the kind of different ways that react to it, uh, that people react to it. So we talked about why does metabolism vary in the case of... Um, uh, a challenge of toxins or a pathogen it upregulates in the case of stress or and especially a perceived lack of food stress it will downregulate. okay so now i've talked about temperature let's get into talking about the thyroid and then i'm going to connect the two together so um the thyroid system starts in the hypothalamus uh then it goes to the pituitary both of those are areas of the brain uh, uh, pituitary is a gland, hypothalamus is considered an area of the brain, sometimes classed along with uh, pituitary as a gland. Um, and then we have the thyroid itself, which is this another gland uh, in the neck. And so the kind of cascade for um, that process is it starts with TRH, which is thyrotropin releasing hormone in the, uh, I believe that's the hypothalamus. Then that signals the pituitary to produce thyroid stimulating hormone called TSH, which is often one of or the only thing that they test in blood tests for thyroid function. Um, if the TH, TSH is increased, then that tells the thyroid to create more T4, otherwise known as thyroxine. So T4 is among the not very well educated in the subject known as thyroid hormone. And I've I might have actually used that terminology before, but the way I like to refer to it now is it's more of a thyroid storage hormone because the effect that it has on actually stimulating cells, which I'll explain in a second, is pretty weak compared to the active thyroid hormone, which is T3. 
So the cascade goes from TRH to TSH to T4 to T3. So most of what I just said can all be tested in blood tests. And so TSH, 3T4, 3T3, so unbound T4 and T3, um, are commonly-ish, depending on who you go to, tested for. The challenge is, and this is what Wilson points out, that all those tests will be able to indicate is what's going on in the blood at best. And we talked about that a little bit. So again, the most ignorant way of testing thyroid function that I see the most mainstream doctors do is only testing TSH. Why that's ignorant is because all it tells you is what it should tell you, which is, is the pituitary creating more TSH? That's all that that test actually tells you. So the, the rationale behind it is, if you're low in thyroid hormone, then your pituitary will create more TSH to tell your thyroid gland to create more thyroid hormone. Now, this is both true and missing a few key components. First of all, the most simple one is if um, that your pituitary might not be working correctly in the same way that your thyroid might not be working correctly, in the same way that your pancreas might not be working correctly, creating too much or too little insulin, etc., etc. So every gland can work suboptimally and... Obviously, we're assessing, is your thyroid working suboptimally? But your pituitary could also be working suboptimally. And so a person could have a normal level of TSH um, and yet have reduced thyroid function because the pituitary is not sending that signal to make for more thyroid hormone. So that's the more obvious objection to TSH, and that's probably the one that I said in the previous video. But there's a more important objection to it that, um, that Wilson talks about, and it's this. The TSH is only going to rise, and in fact, should only even rise, in response to not enough T4 in the being created by the thyroid gland and perhaps in circulation in the blood. But what about if you have a situation where your TSH is normal and you have plenty of T4 in your blood, an, op an optimal level, let's say, in blood tests, and yet you have all the symptoms I just talked about, including low temperature, which we'll talk about. Well, here's the thing. Doctors act as if the, when T4 is in the optimal level in the blood, everything is fine. But actually, all the T4 blood test will tell you is how much T4 is in your blood. It will not tell you what, how your metabolism is doing, which is the crucial point, which is why we spent so long talking about that before we started talking about the thyroid or any of these markers. Why is that? Because... First of all, there's the conversion of T4 into T3, the actual active thyroid hormone, like we talked about. So what does active thyroid hormone mean? So we have all these cells in our body. Almost all of them, except for red blood cells, have these mitochondria inside, which are these little energy factories. You hear a lot of talk about mitochondria these days and ATP and metabolism. For some reason, so many people teaching about all this stuff, they talk about carnitine and CoQ10 and all this stuff, and they're like... They don't talk about thyroid, but the most important factor by far that controls how quickly those mitochondria are creating energy or at what rate they're creating energy, the signal that tells them to speed up or slow down. Just before I say what it is, remember we talked earlier about enzymes. We talked about that's the primary difference between enzyme functions in your body. Are they going the perfect speed for the situation? Are they going too slow? Are they going too fast? That's that's really the biggest thing. And the whole thing about us being at this ideal temperature is because we want as many of these enzymes as possible to be at optimal level, which most of them are optimal level at 98.6 or 37. Okay, so that's the enzymes. What about the mitochondria? The mitochondria needs an adequate amount of T3, which is the active thyroid hormone, to get into the cell to give the signal to produce the optimal amount of energy. Optimal amount of T3 will tell the mitochondria to produce the optimal amount of energy. Now things can still go wrong. There can still be a deficiency of oxygen, there can be a deficiency of magnesium or other micronutrients. So it's not the only thing that goes wrong with that process, but it is the most obvious and the most important that you simply haven't got the signal to increase the metabolism speed 
to an optimal level. Because you so, don't have enough of that active form of T3. Yes, uh, active form of thyroid hormone, which is T3, yeah. So uh, basically more T3 is like um, foot on the gas accelerator, less T3 is foot on the brake. That's how the body, uh, the, you know, every mitochondria in every cell perceives that level of T3. So here's the thing. We talked about the limitations of T4 in the blood. So one of the problems is that a lot of people have an issue of converting T4 into T3. Why would they have the, that kind of issue? Uh, a few, actually many different reasons. The first thing to understand is that while the creation of T3 happens primarily in the thyroid gland, conversion of T4 into T3 doesn't. It actually happens throughout the body and it especially happens the most important areas are the liver and the intestines. And so to go back to your question, if there is a suboptimal functioning in general, but especially of the liver and the intestines, as there so often is, for all kinds of reasons, which we've talked about in previous episodes, so I really don't want to get into it again because it's a massive conversation, so I'd refer people to those other episodes about what can go wrong with the intestines and liver. And let's face it, if you're listening to this, you've probably heard about that stuff before anyway. So if your liver and your intestines is not optimal, then that conversion of, t and there could be other reasons as well, but these are the most common, then that conversion of T4 to T3 could be not optimal. But here's the crazy thing, and this is what Wilson points out. Even if you have, and this is, from my experience, not as common, but even if you have relatively good levels of T3, 3T3 even, in your blood, that still doesn't mean that your metabolism is functioning anywhere near optimally because it's only telling you the T3 levels in your blood. Whereas what we need to know is what the T3 levels are in the mitochondria of the cells. So what test do we need to do to assess the level of T3 in the mitochondria of the cells? There is no blood test. There is no mitochondria biopsy test either. And so, so what's the point in talking about this then, right? Like, well, this is Wilson's perspective. There is a way. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality, affordable supplements that Elwin and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers, but the prices are very affordable. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're really helpful and friendly. And what I love most of all is the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it, I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have from most articles. So, to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code RejuvenateMe for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code RejuvenateMe at feelyounger.net. Well, so, I mean, God, and it just also goes to show you that how how wonderful our system, you know, with being able to test, being able to do things, but we can't still quite figure this part out because it's, you know, as you're just describing it all, it's like, oh gosh, why haven't we been able to figure it out? But here we have Wilson and, you know, I think I know where you're going to go with that. Is he okay, Owen? You know, how, what does he develop? What, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, actually, let, just before I get into that, I just want to explain one of the mechanisms. So we talked about TRH, TSH, T4, T3, and the mitochondria. Now, here's one other element that not many people talk about. I don't think I talked about it in my previous thyroid episode. Wilson isn't the only one to talk about it. I've seen other health uh, experts talk about it in different contexts. But he, I think, has the best explanation of it. So there is this other form of thyroid hormone called reverse T3. Yeah, I've heard and that. I've seen, I've heard of it, but I was like, okay, so yeah, what is it? Well, what's its importance? What does it indicate? So there's T4, there's T3, which is where one iodine uh, molecule is taken away. So T4 is tyrosine, four iodine molecules. Uh, T3 is tyrosine, three iodine molecules. It's that small difference. Well, reverse T3 is almost the same as T3 and T4, but the iodine molecule is in a different position. And because it's in that different position, um, it 
it has a completely different effect on the cell. So T4 stimulates the mitochondria very weakly, as we said. T3 stimulates it very powerfully, but reverse T3 doesn't stimulate it at all. And it actually blocks it. So if, uh, as we said, if there's too much T4, not enough T3, there's not enough stimulation of the cell going on because the T4 is too weak compared to the T3. But even worse, if there's a lot of reverse T3, the T3 will go into that receptor and not only will it stimulate it less than T3 like T4 will, but it actually won't stimulate it at all and it takes up that receptor, receptor. position. What creates the reverse T3? Stress. <laughs> stress, very specifically stress. And this is, we're almost now getting to the crux of Wilson's temperature syndrome, why he believes that people have the issue, why it actually is reversible, unlike what most people who teach thyroid think. So we're almost there. So with reverse T3, in the situation of, now, we're going a little bit beyond stress. We're talking about severe stress. We're talking about trauma, right? We're talking about intense stress. And when you talk about trauma, are you talking about like uh, emotional abuse trauma? Or are we talking about like where are we, or just trauma just in a general anything, space? Okay. Anything that your body uh, considers such a level of stress that it's overwhelming. That could be a you know, severe infection. That could be an accident. That could be psychological abuse. That could be... Uh, anything, violence, you know, whatever. I mean, it could be starvation, right? It doesn't happen to you and me, but it can happen to people in, you know, different environments. So anything that is like perceived as life-threatening to you or your loved ones or something like that um, could definitely fall under this category. And it can even be positive trauma. So Wilson talks about the most common trauma that leads to this Wilson temperature syndrome, which I'll explain more what that means in a few minutes, is uh, pregnancy and childbirth, childbirth specifically. So it's not bad, but the body considers it to be a highly overwhelming experience. And so it still causes a big shift. So here's the thing. If you have T4, your body could turn it into T3, this active thyroid hormone. Instead, it turns it into reverse T3, which is this completely inactive uh, thyroid hormone, kind of thyroid hormone, although it doesn't actually do any of the job of thyroid hormone. And so... So why would your body do that? Again, is, is it trying to get it into that conservation mode? Exactly. Yes. That's why I talked about that earlier. Yeah. That's exactly what it's trying to do. That is the mechanism whereby it gets into the conservation mode. That is the mechanism whereby it slows the metabolism down. Because we just I just said higher T3 is like the gas pedal, lower T3 is the brake. But what about what about the handbrake? I don't drive, but you know what, what's like the extreme brake? You know, not not just the yeah, the emergency brake. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. What's the, what's the emergency brake? What's the let's really slow this down? Sorry, let's really slow this down very quickly. Yeah. Right. So that's the reverse T three response as opposed to just reducing the level of T three. Um, and I'm you know maybe biochemists listen to this going, ah, I'm trying to, you know, like I, I know that there's always some degree of T3 in, and I know there's always some degree of reverse T3. I'm kind of talking in extremes to help people understand it. it you know, it's broadly correct, even though it's it's more nuanced than that in, in practice. So anyway, um, so with the reverse T3, that's how it goes into conservation mode. Absolutely correct. And so uh, this is what Wilson hypothesizes, and he does more than that. He's pretty convinced of it, that, during a time of extreme trauma, and actually before I talk about his theory, I'll talk about my experience for a second, why this resonated with me so much. I had had uh, several times throughout my life where I had been through extreme trauma, and my res and I think you were actually maybe around with one of them, Chrissy. It wasn't like uh, emotional trauma or whatever, um, but it was when I was in pain a few years ago. And... Uh, I got really cold and this happened to me a few different times and I remember asking uh, people around me who I thought would know the answer I was like why is it when I get stressed I get really cold and they didn't really understand it and they didn't know why that's the case and I say this not everyone is aware of this because when you're in extreme tr trauma sometimes you are completely oblivious to your body's temperature so if you cannot relate to this at all it doesn't mean it is not you but I'm saying for those of you who do remember this and can relate to this you might have a, like an aha moment um and so what i observed and i because i became v very aware of my 
temperature and uh, stuff like that, especially over the last year, I observed even little mini traumas, No, nothing that bad, but something would like shock me, overwhelm me, put me out of sorts, I would feel cold, and then I wouldn't bounce back. Like, I, I would bounce back a bit, but, you know, let's say if I was functionally optimally at a 10, I would drop to a 2, but I wouldn't go right back to a 10 the next day. I might be a 6, and I might stay at a 6 for quite a while, and it would be quite hard for me to get back to this level of 10. So what I learned, uh, you know, with Wilson's theory is that that thing that I'd observed quite, what's the word, minor versions of, occurring to me over the last year, there's much more extreme versions of that, where a person goes into this kind of uh, extreme trauma, shock kind of situation, their temperature drops, and then, um, as I said, a lot of people don't notice it because there's so much intense emotion and all the rest going on, you're not aware of the, the level of <laughs> uh, warmth or cold you have in your body necessarily, but some people do notice it, and I did notice it. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna say because I have been in some, you know, alternative healing sessions where my body either got super, super hot or it would get cold. I mean, that has occurred too. So I, I I've noticed those because they were a bit more severe in their fluctuations. But um, yeah, so that's what was popping up when you were sharing your story. Okay, so yeah, it has happened to you. So my understanding is like that. Uh, peak, uh, peak of cortisol will make you feel warm, um, but the conversion of T4 into reverse T3 in large amounts is what makes you feel cold. That's the distinction. And they do go together, and which is sometimes maybe, I, I'm only speculating, but maybe experientially they cancel each other out. Like the person doesn't experience the drop in perception of temperature because the spike of cortisol was kind of canceling it out. But for me, it was you know severe enough that I did notice. Uh, some people, as you say, feel hot uh, because the spike in adrenal uh, chemicals overrides the conversion to reverse T3. I was the other way around. The conversion to reverse T3 overrode any adrenal chemicals and I felt cold. Uh, so it can go in both ways. But however we perceive it, the crucial thing is that afterwards, we stay in that conservation mode and we don't bounce back again. And that is what Wilson calls Wilson's temperature syndrome. And so he his perspective is that for a lot of people, maybe they have numerous you know, trauma, shocks, stresses, whatever, but at some point, especially if there is a certain factors and especially if there's a predisposition towards it, which we can talk about, it kind of, the temperature drops and then it doesn't recover again. And if we think about it, this may be way more common than we think. It just might be more extreme for some than others. Because we all know that these days people are so unhealthy this is not as true anymore but people watching who are our age Chrissy like we still remember you know when you're like 20 ish you can go out and barely have any sleep and take loads of drugs and drink loads of alcohol and all the rest of it get up the next day and feel great right so people are so sickly these days maybe that's not as relatable anymore but certainly you know our age and our parents age and all the rest of it that was like a pretty common uh, thing for most people and then at some point, usually it's, you know, hits you about 30 or in your 30s. You can't do that anymore, right? You start, if you drink as much as you used to, oh my God, you feel terrible. You know, if you uh, overeat junk food as much as you used to, you feel terrible. If you miss sleep as much as you used to, you feel terrible. And so what's going on there? Well, you know, everyone would just say you're getting old. But what if it's simply that your metabolism is slowed down? And in fact, a lot of people will say that, Right. You, you know, I used to be able to get away with eating a lot and now I can't because my metabolism is not what it was. And now, I, and now I gain weight when I overeat. So we even talk about this colloquially to some degree. So that may be uh, what is actually going on. So for Wilson's perspective, he actually agrees with your GP in the sense that your GP says hypothyroidism is extremely rare and you probably don't have it. And he actually says hypothyroidism is extremely rare and you probably don't have it. What you have instead from his perspective, is this, Wilson's temperature syndrome. You don't have hypothyroidism because true hypothyroidism, from his point of view, is that your thyroid hormone is not producing enough T4. That does happen, but it's relatively rare. What's much more common, from his perspective again, I keep speaking from him, is either that your body's not converting enough T4 into T3. That's common, and I talked about you know, digestion, liver and stuff like that. But again, stress will significantly negatively impact that conversion of T4 to T3, as will nutritional deficiencies, which can be caused by stress. And then 
most importantly from his point of view, that conversion, not just the there's not enough from T4 to T3, but that there's too much from T4 to reverse T3. And for that reason, he says it can be counterproductive and actually make things worse to take any T4, which I will explain and expand upon when we get to um, how do we actually, how does Wilson's system help to reverse the situation? But before that, let's go to your previous question, which was going to be... Yes, so about how do we figure out whether, you know, to measure it correctly, because we can't do it with the blood test. Absolutely, yeah. So as we said, you can't bi biopsy your mitochondria. So how do you know if there's actually enough free T3 getting there? Well, with blood tests, you can measure the level of free T3 in your blood. If you go to a, you know, do a specialized test, you can even measure how much reverse T3 there is in your blood. And these will give clues from my perspective. I don't agree with Wilson that they are kind of useless, but I do agree with his overall point. He doesn't quite say that they're useless. What he says is the level of all of these hormones, whether it's reverse T3, free T3, TSH, all of them, is they will reflect your body's, where your body's at, at the moment of taking the blood in its attempts to keep your temperature and your metabolism at the level that it wants to keep it. So meaning, if it's trying to get your metabolism up to 37 or trying to keep it at 37, stroke 98.6, then that will be reflected in your blood. But if it's in conservation mode and it's trying to keep it at 97 or 36, then that will be reflected in your blood. And so you may see that, like, I rarely see people with T3, T3 right at the top of the reference range who don't feel pretty good, but I have seen it. Uh, I rarely see people with reverse T3 above the reference range who feel fantastic, but I have seen it. So, you know, it is, they give an indicator, but Wilson says they're not 100% reliable. So what is 100% reliable? Simply checking the temperature because your temperature will tell you not where the intermediary processes are at, but what the end result is, what your actual metabolism is actually doing. Does that make sense? That makes absolute sense, yes. And so how do you measure it? Different people give different measure methods. We talked about Broder Barnes before and his method, um, which is to test it first thing in the morning. Uh, Wilson does not recommend that. He says to test it three hours after you wake up, and then after another three hours, and then after another three hours. And to do that three times a day, so three hours after you wake up, six hours after you wake up, nine hours after you wake up, and do that three days in a row, add those all together and get an average. So that's yeah, I mean, his that method of doing it. Yeah, that makes sense because taking an average because one day maybe you didn't get enough sleep or things like that. So yeah, that, that, yeah, that's good. I would add some additional recommendation. I think it's good to do it. So what I've, it, it, my experience, it does take a few hours to warm up. So when you sleep, you do go into a conservation mode, of course, because you're sleeping. When you first wake up, that's where Broder Barnes would say to do it. And he would say it should be about 36.6 to 36.8, which is, I think, 98 to 98.2. Sorry. Yeah, 98 to 98.2, something like that. Um, so that's fine. And that also tells you something. But Wilson's not looking at that. He's looking at what is it when it should be 37? So by the time you've been awake for three hours, up to about by the time you've been awake for nine hours, that should be your peak metabolism time, roughly. So that's why he's getting you to test it at that time. Because if it's not 98.6 or 37, then it's like how far away is it? And the further away it is, the worse you're going to feel from his perspective. He talks about... All these chronic symptoms will go away when you're at 37 or 98.6. For some people, they'll go away at 36.9 or 98.4. For some people, they go away at 36.8 or 98.2, whatever. Like different people have a relief of symptoms once they reach a different level, but everyone has a relief of symptoms by the time they hit 
the you know very highest <laughs> the sweet level. spot. And um, uh, talk to me about this because we have discussed it before about food and that knowing that your thyroid is functioning well, that once you know after you eat, your temperature should increase. So talk to me a little bit about taking these temperatures and food consumption and things like that. So I don't think Wilson does men mention this, but whenever I ask people to measure temperatures, which I do a lot, um, I, I do a slightly different version, as you say, Chrissy. I ask them to test it first thing upon waking, just to see how it is. And then uh, like an hour, ideally-ish before lunch and an hour-ish after lunch. So that should be, you know, three, four, five hours after you've woken up, something like that. That's what I'm expecting. Um, maybe six, seven even. The point is it's the middle of the day when your temperature should be the highest. And I'm looking for the difference between before and after lunch because I'm looking to see um, if it is significantly higher before lunch than after. And when I say significantly, that that's like a point two difference. No, sorry. Point, yeah, point two difference with centigrade or point four difference with Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit I'd say that's very significant. Um, if it's significantly lower after you eat, that meant that the high temperature before you ate was false. It was based on, as I said, adrenal chemicals. So the true reading is more the after you eat reading from my point of view. Um, if it's the other way around, if your temperature is significantly lower before you eat than after you ate, that's a sign that either you waited too long to eat or that you're struggling with hypoglycemia, which you, I guess you could say are the same thing. And Wilson does talk about hypoglycemia in his book. He talks about like the response to hypoglycemia of making sure you keep your blood sugar high and not letting it crash and all that kind of stuff that I recommend in my hypoglycemia episode. He does recommend that. He says sometimes that's enough to get people out of conservation mode and get their metabolism boosted again. Most of the time, unfortunately, it's not enough. But he certainly you know, agrees with that perspective because if you consistently feed yourself and don't let your blood sugar drop, the same thing about making sure you eat not long after you wake up that we, we've talked about recently and many times before. Um, all of that stuff is saying to your body, there's enough food. You can get out of conservation mode now. You can get out of starvation mode. You can get out of being in low metabolism, which ironically will actually help you to lose weight. <laughs> so not starving yourself, making sure you eat as soon as you wake up and making sure you eat regularly can help you lose weight if the problem is that low metabolism. And we've given all the other indicators for what could be low metabolism, but the ultimate way of testing if you have a low metabolism, we've just told you, it's to actually test the temperature. So a few details on that. I do not recommend using a digital thermometer. This is not just because everyone seems to say not to do it in the books. I tried it. The problem is you put a digital thermometer in your mouth. One minute it says 36.3, take it out, put it back in, 36.7, take it out, put it in, 36.4. Like that's useless. The difference that it will give you one minute to the next is so huge that from Wilson's point of view, that could be the difference between feeling fantastic and feeling sick. That's, that's no good. So you need a thermometer that's way more precise and accurate than that. So that's kind of the... Old style mercury thermometers, they're illegal these days, but I think they use gallium or whatever. But if you Google mercury thermometer, you'll see a bunch of alternatives. But we're talking about the old style thermometer. Yeah, the old kind, you got to shake it down, you got to keep it in there for a good like four minutes, maybe something like that. And you got to twist it so you can see where it's at. Yeah, five minutes minimum. Yeah, they are a pain, um, but they are the only ones that are really accurate from my understanding. Um, some people say underarm, some people say in the mouth. Um, the only problem with doing it in your mouth is if you have some kind of respiratory infection, you can get a bit of a false. So I I would expect the underarm to be about 0.2 less centigrade, 0.4 less Fahrenheit, um, roughly, at, like at most. Um, if there's more of a divergence than that, then that would indicate that maybe you do have some kind of infection in the mouth. But if it's pretty similar, mouth and armpit, then you can just do whichever one you prefer, like um, I would say, uh, whatever's more convenient to you. I find under the arm, you've got to probably hold it for 10 minutes. Five minutes is not enough to raise it sufficiently. So that would be one reason why you might prefer to put it in the mouth, despite that being more inconvenient in other ways. Um, so yeah, so find out. That, so that's really the way to find out from Wilson's point of view. And once you have that average, going back to his system, three, six, and nine hours after waking, three days, once you have that average, um, then you work on increasing that temperature, uh, not through stress, but through actually raising the metabolism. And so he has a method of doing that, which is very simple, slightly risky from a mainstream medical point of view, which is why it's 
hasn't really caught on. But for my experience and understanding, so much less risky than you know most of the drug versions of dealing with all this kind of stuff. Another sign of low thyroid function and Wilson's temperature syndrome is high cholesterol. And you know the drugs they give you for low sexual function, the drugs they give you for digestive issues, the drugs they give you even for skin issues, the drugs they give you for low energy, the drugs they give you for depression. Like all of these are more dangerous than this approach to me, just, even though it is. Just watch some of the American commercials here and you'll, you'll understand why they're so dangerous. Yes. Uh, but it's not completely, um, what's the word, without any risk, Wilson's method. And so that's why I would not recommend doing it without medical supervision. And even though I'm someone who's pretty much does everything on myself without medical supervision, uh, I did and do do this with medical supervision. I would very strongly encourage everyone to do it, to do the same. And if you're like, I can't find a doctor who does that, Elwin. Um, well, we have Dr. Miriam, right? She's our kind of, uh, um, what's the word? Associated doctor for this show. And I can certainly refer her to you if you're in the UK and the EU. And if not, I can still refer her to you. And she knows people throughout the world, especially people in the US. Um, and she can refer you to someone nearby. So there is always someone who you know will be able to do this for you. They're not always easy to find, but luckily you have this show. And uh, we can connect you with someone maybe directly or indirectly. Yeah, and I say that here because one of the most common comments I get whenever I talk about this is, oh, my doctor won't help me with this. No doctors help me with this. Like, no, no, they do exist. They may be rare. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. You have to find them. You have to, and, and it really is seeking them out because, I mean, I was listening to something else today um, and, uh, you know, things that we don't really discuss here, but like where a doctor had sent, said to somebody uh, that had had um, great results and said, oh, please don't tell everybody around because we don't want to give them false hope. It's like, but why wouldn't you want to share this great result and these certain things? So you got to find the right person for you. They, and like you said, Ellen, they are out there. Just keep looking for them. They are the minority, but I'm sure, you know, every great person in your life, you know, your your wife, your husband, your your business partner, your boss, your employee, whatever it is, you know, your your, your best friend. Um, I'm trying to think of voluntary relationships rather than family. Like every voluntary relationship that you truly treasure, probably that person is one in a thousand or one in a million, but you still found them. So you can do the same with a doctor. So anyway, just before we get into what Wilson does, one more thing I want to remember to talk about is some people do have more of a propensity for this thing about getting into conservation mode and not being able to get themselves out of it and others. Would that come through their genetic? Yes. And the specific factor, I don't know if there's more. I'd love to be able to do a report on this at some point. But the specific one that Wilson um, has identified is people who a lot of their ancestors went through starvation are more likely to go for this. So he identifies, off the top of my head, definitely the Irish, uh, Native Americans, Russians, I suppose Chinese, given you know what happened in the early part of the 20th century. Um, but yeah, I suppose long histories of famine is really what he's talking about. I don't know. But if you know that your ancestors had a long history of famine, that means that they are more adapted to getting into and staying in this conservation mode because they're almost kind of like primed for it. They're expecting it. And if if food does show up again the next day, they're not trusting it. They're not believing it because they're so used to 
being in the starvation mode. So that's Wilson's theory on it. And that's, you know, not just a theory, that's his clinical experience that people with that ancestry, uh, they have this issue more commonly. He also says women have it more commonly than men. And he says that uh, after pregnancy is the number one shock or trauma that he noticed that then afterwards um, women don't recover their temperature. And this is so, I've heard it so many times, Chrissy. I don't, you know, that people, and I'm sure you have with your friends, women give birth, they maybe have the postpartum thing a little bit or whatever. You know, when you're pregnant, you're flooded with progesterone. Not all women enjoy being pregnant, but there's definite upside with the flood of progesterone. Then you give birth, the progesterone plummets. So suddenly all that anti-stress hormone goes away. The prolactin shoots up to help you lactate but then that's a stress hormone that makes you feel worse. So no wonder a lot of women feel terrible. And then you're not sleeping and all those challenges that I've only heard about, I haven't been through, um, but it all sounds terrible and I have <laughs> a lot of compassion for you. And then, you know, a lot of women go for this, but then eventually the baby's sleeping through the night, but then you're still gonna look after them basically 24 hours a day, but then eventually they start going to school and visiting friends and all the rest and like, and you're still exhausted. You're still like, haven't recovered and, and you know many women talk about they never do right yeah like they never get back to what they were before and you know i people and i have to admit i've been down that i'm quite down in the process of having children because of that it just seems like a, a high risk for for that happening to you and and you know the rate of uh uh ch rate of birth that was it called uh you know, the, the birth, yeah, the birth rate is going down in a lot of different countries and I can completely understand it. Like women, you know, more informed now than ever with the age of information or the rest of it, you know, you know, that you hear horror stories and, and, you know, this risk and that and all the rest of it. And I can completely understand, you know, given that all these people I know, they kind of went through this and they never recovered. Do I really want to risk that for myself? But so I'm very, um, excited about the possibility of this that this is really a way of recovering from that fully and feeling better than you ever have no it's true i mean I, there's probably lots of other reasons for you know the birth rate and things are changing and fertility issues and stuff too but but i will agree like on knowing the the things that you go through after and, and i love i loved being pregnant i love having my kids all of that but things just didn't absolutely go go right. It's like what you were talking about earlier, where you're, you just don't fully recover. And then, you know, keep that with another pregnancy and so on, so forth. And your body just doesn't get back to that 100%. So if, you know, I'm really looking forward to trying this because, you know, it's one of those things you do your best and you continue to look for the things, you know, because you're like, you know, something's not 100% right. And then that also puts pressure on the relationship internally with your spouse and you know other things so if there is you know the positivity of this potentially helping so many people get back to that space then you know i'm yeah i'm very very intrigued awesome yeah i'm really excited about it and i've been doing it for uh three months now uh i'm not at the end of the process i'm not weaned off it yet but i can tell and so is my wife she's been doing it for a similar amount of time hannah and we definitely both by far feel better than we've ever felt in our lives. That's, you know, significant. Um, it's more noticeable with her because I was more on the side of like keeping myself going with stress and she was more on the side of like just kind of going more into conservation mode. So the transformation with her is a bit more obvious. She's like a butterfly coming out of a chrysalis. Like she's she's so happy because she's always wanted to be super productive and she's getting loads she's getting loads done now and she's busy all day and you know everything that she wanted to be doing and so she's delighted uh, and me too. You know I, I'm enjoying it too. Um, but anyway, before we start talking about the benefits, let's talk about um, Wilson's protocol and how it's different from other people's and in fact even what i've talked about in previous thyroid episodes and we'll talk about what i've talked about so all right i'm going to go for it one at a time let's start with the bottom of the right bottom of the ladder t4 only therapy levothyroxine this is if you get anything from a normal doctor, this is probably what they're going to give you. Right. For that first thing, okay, that you, somebody's going to be on T4 only, levothyroxine, because that's just what they do. Yeah. Now, 
the one good thing you could say about levothyroxine is, you know, people call it a drug because it is classified as a drug, but it actually is a bioidentical hormone. It is exactly the same thing that your body makes itself. So that's something. But it is the storage hormone. So in order for it to be effective, several things have to happen. Number one, your body has to be able to convert it from T4 into T3. Number two, it has to not convert it into reverse T3. And number three, the T3 has to actually get to the mitochondria of the cells where it has an effect. So those are three things that have to happen. If any of those either do or don't happen as they should, then um, the effect will be minimal and in fact can make it worse, which is what I'll address in a sec. But let's just go for that one first. Most of the people, including most of the people watching this, know that that's not a good idea. Ray P, who I know a lot of people are uh, f uh, fans of who watch this, talked about how that's usually not a good idea. Um, and the obvious reason for that is because if the person struggles to convert enough T4 to T3, they're still not going to get the benefit. Okay, so I won't talk about that too much. We talked about it in the previous episode. So therefore, what's usually recommended, and I think even what I previously recommended, was T4 and T3. So give your body some T4 and some T3. The most obvious natural way of doing that and the way that was the very first type of thyroid support is thyroid glandular, right? So otherwise known as NDT, natural desiccated thyroid. Armor thyroid being one example of it. So in a natural desiccated thyroid, it usually comes through a pig. Sometimes they see a cow these days, um, bovine. It comes in a ratio of about four to one, four parts T4 to about one part T3. So what does the mainstream medical establishment say of that? They're not keen. Uh, they frown on the few doctors who are willing to do it. Why, why aren't they keen? Because T3 is more likely to give you side effects because it is actually the active hormone, not the storage hormone. Um, it's more likely to especially if you're already severely dysfunctional, make you feel worse. So this could be for a few different reasons, some of them positive, some of them not. So first of all, there is a downside to speeding up metabolism. There are actually a few different downsides, but there's one particularly obvious one. So we talked about when you speed up metabolism, you need more food. But that isn't only calories. If you speed up metabolism, you need more nutrients in general. Every enzyme that speeds up that we were talking about earlier requires all its cofactors. An example of that would be magnesium. You might have heard before, magnesium is required for over 300, 500, 800, 1,000 different enzymatic processes. That's like a boast about magnesium. Zinc, similar, right? So how are all those enzymes going to do if they try and speed up and they're running low on the cofactor they need to do it? That's not good. That can create problems. That can create deficiencies. Well, they can take a deficiency that's probably already there and make it a severe deficiency. So that, I believe, is one reason why higher T3 um, can make things worse. Because if your body is trying not to upregulate your metabolism because it is conserving, because there's not enough nutrition, by giving it pure T3, you're forcing it to speed up the metabolism and you are potentially exacerbating that nutritional deficiency. So ideally, a person would do a kind of broad spectrum nutritional evaluation of the type that I often recommend to make sure that they aren't suffering with at least any, you know, severe nutritional deficiencies to make sure that they're okay. And ideally, a person is eating well and getting plenty of not just the right calories and the right amounts, but the right micronutrients as well. Okay, so that's one potential issue. Of course, do they talk about any of that? No. They're talking about practical stuff. Heart palpitations, heart arrhythmia, but what causes that? Often a magnesium deficiency, which is why I talked about that in the first place, or a potassium deficiency, which uh, can be made even worse when you speed up the metabolism. The other reason, and this is like on the armor, thyroid, prescription, side effect, sheet thing, is that for those with, uh, I think it turns adrenal issues, uh, it can make it worse. So basically, if you're already anxious, it can make you more anxious. Um, why? I've heard different fears of that, but my understanding is this. If you're the type of person who is low thyroid and just slowed down, this is unlikely to be an issue to you. But if you're a person who is low thyroid, who has decided to, again, made an unconscious autonomous bodily decision to run on stress, then your body has probably 
been flooded with adrenaline for a long time. As a result of that, whenever there is a excess of a hormone or neurotransmitter in the system, the receptors will tend to downregulate the sensitivity. An obvious example of that that most people heard of is insulin resistance, right? Too much insulin floating around for too long, the, bot the cells start, to, the receptors specifically start to get resistant to that insulin. So the same thing happens to adre with adrenaline. You can start to get adrenaline resistance. And when you start taking T3 specifically, it increases the sensitivity of those receptors. So suddenly you start feeling more adrenaline. Your heart rate can go up significantly. Now there's two elements to this. First of all, there's a lot of people walking around with a resting heart rate of 60 or even lower who think it must be because they somehow have lucked into having the metabolism of an elite athlete. And what they actually have is a slow metabolism. <laughs> um, uh, when you speed up the metabolism to a level it should be, it will shoot up and it might the heart rate might go from 60 to being 70, 80, even 90. And that's not something to be concerned of. It's not something to be concerned of, even from a mainstream point of view. If you go to a doctor and say, my heart rate is 90 beats a minute, they'll go, okay, go away. So it's not really an issue of concern on its own, but it can go higher than that. It can go over 100. And this is one of the, and that is potentially an issue that's referred to as uh, palpitations, I think, or is that tachycardia? Can't remember, but it's high. I think it's tachycardia. Um, it's high, and if you're resting, it shouldn't be that high. And so that's one of the things that's possible to happen with T3 because of the, what I just said, the sensitization of the adrenaline and stuff like that. Usually it's a temporary side effect, uh, is what I've heard clinically from practitioners, meaning it only lasts for a few days. But usually if it happens, the doctor will say, okay, you know, take less until it's subsided and then try adding it back in again slowly. Um, so those are the ones that I'm aware of. I'm not a doctor. We are planning to have Dick, Dr. Miriam on to talk about the practical application of Wilson syndrome. We decided between us that I would talk about the theory so she just didn't have to make any claims like Wilson makes um, as a you know registered medical doctor, but she can just talk about her practical experience applying it. So we do want to have her on to do that soon. Um, but those are the ones that I am aware of um, from a practical point of view. So yeah. Okay. All right, so we just discussed the T4 only, the, just being on the levothyroxine and then the, uh, having the natural desiccated thyroid and what ah. those... Yeah, so we discussed why doctors don't like it, but um, why it's generally recommended is it's, look, your thyroid's low, give it some T4. So T4 um, lasts a lot longer than T3. This is the main point that Ray Pete made about T3. He said it gets breaking down in two to three hours. Wilson says it takes two and a half days. I believe that they're possibly both correct depending on how you're measuring it. Um, but anyway, what they both agree on, what everyone agrees on, it gets broken down significantly more quickly than T4. So the idea is T4 is like your, plenty of your storage hormone. T3 is like your immediate hormone. Get a bit of both, jobs are good. That would be the uh, kind of standard alternative approach. Now, Here's where Wilson, again, is different. What he says is, that's all fine and dandy if your problem is actual hyperthyroidism. But as he says, most people, from his perspective, don't have that. What they have is the Wilson's temperature syndrome. So what is the problem with Wilson's temperature syndrome? If you remember, from a practical point of view, it may be partly that not enough T4 is converted into T3, but there's actually something much more important that's actually much worse than that which is too much T4 is being converted into reverse T3, which is not only weaker than T3, it's actually like, it's the, the anti-T3. It actually significantly slows the metabolism down by taking up that receptor and, and blocking T3 from being able to act on it at all. So from his perspective, certainly with T4 therapy, but even with a glandular therapy where you're having some T4, some T3, the problem is you're never going to get better because so long as you keep giving your body T4, it will keep converting into reverse T3, which will keep suppressing your metabolism. So from his perspective, the only way to restore the metabolism is to, first of all, stop taking any T4 
And he has a particular procedure from this. I know Dr. Miriam applies it a little bit differently. Perhaps his other practitioners each apply it in their own idiosyncratic way. But what they all have in common is no T4. And then enough T3 that even your thyroid gland goes, you know what? There's so much T3 flying around. I'm not going to make hardly any T4. So then you're not taking T4 in. Your thyroid's not making T4, and so there's no longer any reverse, sorry, no longer any raw material for your body to make reverse T3 out of. Then slowly, his perspective is, as I understand it, that reverse T3 starts to, um, the levels of it start to reduce until eventually that reverse T3 is completely depleted, all the receptors which were blocked with reverse T3 no longer are because it does slowly degrade, just like the other ones do, just like T4 and T3 degrades. Reverse T3 also degrades. So all of it that's there degrades and no more is being made because there's no T4 to turn into reverse T3. T4 can turn into reverse T3, but T3 can't turn into reverse T3. So that's why it's T3 only. Right. Yeah. Now... There is a problem with this that Ray Pete pointed out for all our, again, Ray Pete listeners, that is accurate, which is T3 will tend to, even if it does take two days to break down, as um, uh, Dr. Wilson says, its action is brief. It will have most of its action within two or three hours of taking it. Right. So if somebody was going to take take everything right at the beginning of the morning, then it's going to, you know, not not last. They're going to have a spike. Maybe their heart rate is going to go well over 100. Three hours later, it's all going to be gone again. They're going to have a crash. So you would have to be taking T3 all day. And here's the crucial thing that Wilson also describes. The amount of T3 is less important for reestablishing healthy temperature than the consistency of the level of T3. So it's from his point of view, it's the wild fluctuations of T3 caused by so spike of stress t3 goes down reverse t3 goes up calm down again t3 goes up again reverse t3 goes down it's the up and down of t3 the roller coaster just like with blood sugar and insulin that we talked about that creates most of the problems so from his point of view to really correct it it's not enough to give t3 or even an abundance of t3 you have to give a stable amount of t3 which is at a consistent level throughout the day and yes, even throughout the night. So 24 hours a day, you want your T3 consistently high and not too high, ever. That's his perspective. How do you achieve that? It's actually pretty much impossible with any form of T3, from my perspective, other than the type he recommends. And he recommends sustained release T3. So, you have sustained release uh, supplements. You have sustained release drugs. So basically, they come. Uh, the active ingredient comes in a capsule with something else. Usually, they use something called HPMC, which is a particular type of cellulose that basically is broken down slowly, and so it just very slowly releases it, not too quickly, not too slowly. You know, there's a little bit of an art to this. So that, so the way that he recommends doing it is exactly 12 hours apart, every 12 hours, you have the same dose. So you wake up at 9 a.m., you have your dose, 9 p.m., have your dose, 9 a.m., have your dose. And he's really very particular about this, that it has to be 12 hours. He says even doing it 9 a.m. and then 9.20 or 8.40, could completely screw up your temperature again. Oof. You've got to be really precise. specific with it. He's a precise, precise. kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he says, he claims this is from, um, you know, abundant clinical experience that whenever it wasn't working, he dug into it and discovered that they were not being consistent enough for the timing of it. So that's, like, really crucial from the, from his perspective. But anyway, the key point being consistent level of T3 throughout the day and throughout the night so then your body has no need to make any T4. It has no ability to make any reverse T3. Therefore, um, the T3 is never too high. So the, um, the heart rate doesn't ever go too high. It's not too low. And so your body never feels the need to raise adrenaline or cortisol to make up for a lack of uh, cellular energy through lack of 
T3, and it's just consistent. And so he talks about a gradual or not so gradual increase of the T3, and basically keep increasing it until you get to a level where you are 98.6 or 37 at that time of the day, the peak time of the day, three to nine hours after waking up, at least between that time. And that's the goal. And then from there, he talks about like, usually by that time, people feel way better, which um, I believe. And then you kind of very carefully and gradually wean them off and give them a little bit less, a little bit less, and see if the temperature stays high. And he says a lot of the time it doesn't, and then you kind of wean them back on again, and then you you leave them for a little bit, and then you try and wean it off again. And, you know, he claims that the way that, that it works, sooner or later, you wean them off, and the temperature stays stabilized, and it stays high. And that's really the thing that you're looking for, stable, high temperature throughout the day. Right, okay. Not too high, right. but high. But high by modern standards, because yes. I believe the average these days is 36 or 98.6. Yeah, that's it's now a lot considered lower normal. than what it should be. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, Elwin, that's a lot. That's fascinating. <laughs> fascinating and so much to like just process and really take in. And I really appreciate how you went into all the detail previously to really explain the processes of what the body does, because then that really understands, you know, why the body is going to, you know, go into that conservation mode and bringing things out. And also by, by um, you know, just focusing on the T3, where it then will let go and, you know, that reverse T3 will, uh, will just, you know, just not be there anymore because it's it's there's got no building blocks to be able to make it anymore so that's exactly it yeah yeah you got it and it's hard to get your head around and if people are struggling a little bit with this you might actually want to watch our first episode on fire it again just to understand the basics first um but yeah, hopefully this made sense. No, it made a lot of sense. It's just now it's the figuring out, okay, so, you know, people have decided, hey, I really want to figure this out. They're going to go get their thermometers, the, the specific type of thermometers. Um, and then let's say they discover it. What's their next step? They're going to have to find a practitioner, correct? Yes. And I think even if you want to do it for yourself, I have not seen anywhere where you can even get sustained release T3 like uh, without a doctor's prescription. So you can get T3 uh, if you're willing to be illicit, but you can't get sustained release. And that is the only type which will really work for this purpose. So um, as I say, um, one avenue, if you, especially if you're in the UK and EU, is uh, just to uh, email us and I'll introduce you to Dr. Miriam or reach out to Dr. Miriam directly. We'll make sure we put a link to her website underneath. Um, another option is to go to uh, Dr. Wilson's site, which again, I can't remember the URL, but we'll make sure to put it in the show notes. Um, I, th I think if you Google Wilson's temperature syndrome, you should be able to find it pretty easy as well. And I, he has especially for the US, I think he has a like a directory you can put in your zip code and it'll tell you who the nearest practitioner is to you, who is able to do his method. So we've kind of got you covered f for the US, he's got you covered. For the UK and Europe, we've got you covered. Anywhere outside of that, you're gonna have to do your own research, but you could always reach out, as I say, to Dr. Wilson, his, his website, and, and ask if there's a practitioner near you. You could reach out to Dr. Miriam and see if she might know a practitioner near you. But I think from what I've seen of our stats, most people watching us are either in uh, in U uh, US or Europe. Australia, I guess, is the other one. Um, and I don't know of anyone there. So if anyone does, please post it underneath on the on YouTube and we'll add that to the, uh, to the list. Beautiful, Ellen. As always, thank you for bringing this to not only me, but to all of our listeners as well. Before we finish, are there any final thoughts that you'd like to share? Yeah, um, just be open to all of this stuff. I would recommend reading his book, Wilson's Temperature Syndrome. Um, if you're the kind of person who wants to really understand what he what what the system is, then he also has a I think it's a doctor's desk guide or something like that, like a free ebook on his website, which is supposed to be for doctors. Like so, the instructions are like how to help patients for doctors. But you can also read that and you, you can understand what a doctor is going to be doing to you if you follow that system. Um, so that would be good as well. If you do actually get hold of Dr. Wilson personally, tell him to reach out to us, get, get on the show. We can interview him. And talk, I'd still love, you know, even though I've now explained this theory, I'd still love to talk about the history of it and, you know, all the clinical experience and all the uh, 
uh, different um, people that he's helped. You know, he has on his book, he has loads of testimonials from all kinds of different doctors about how they've applied it and how it's helped people and stuff like that. Um, it is, what's the word, pretty controversial. There's not... But from what I've seen, I haven't seen a lot of people go, you know what, I did it and it really messed me up. What I've seen is a lot of people who go, oh, that sounds like nonsense because of the, the. So it's like coming from a place of ignorance as opposed to a place of experience. So, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about it so far. Um, and as I say, from an experiential point of view, it's been fantastic for me. I'm not even convinced. I think I might actually be that person who was genuinely hypothyroid because I had a genuinely high TSH reading. Um you know a while ago and because i have the genetic tendency and all the rest of it so i'm not even sure if this will be effective for me in terms of not ever needing any thyroid again but i know i'm definitely a candidate for it simply because as i said i could see the correlation and connection between i would have a trauma or a shock or something like that and then it would just take me ages to recover and my health and well-being and mood and everything would drop for a while and and I think it never fully recovered. I I would say, if you if you perceive life as like a series of tragedies or shocks or stresses or traumas or whatever it may be that have slowly ground you down and you've never been able to get back up again, and I know a lot of people who feel that way, whether you've made that into philosophy of you know life just grinds you down or whether you still try and be positive and optimistic but it's just so hard or whatever whatever you might be, um, this yeah this is potentially a solution and I can't make any guarantees of course but um, it makes a lot of sense to me doing the procedure actually uh, feels fantastic to me i've not experienced any negative side effects at all and you know talking to dr miriam she says so far no one has who she's worked with it as well so while it is always possible um, i do think it is you know pretty safe and safer than as i said a lot of the average things that they give to people for all these issues that are really related to this that don't even resolve the root issue that only you know maybe treat the symptoms at best um, yeah, just lastly, thank you for watching. Make sure to comment, subscribe, uh, share. These days I'm realizing that it's really important that we have reviews and star ratings on Spotify and Apple as well. That really helps us. It helps us get better guests, honestly. Who knows if we reached out to Dr. Wilson and we had hundreds of reviews on uh, an Apple or whatever, then he might have replied. So please, in order to help us get uh, you know, the, the best possible guests and uh to really support us it's very simple um I, I think it literally takes a few seconds just give us uh give us a rating on spotify or, or apple if you're listening there it really helps yeah and the other thing is i mentioned earlier how we don't have a genetic report for wilson's temperature syndrome specifically and that's absolutely true but i just literally spoke to a client today who had a pattern that made it pretty obvious like they had high cortisol a tendency a high risk of having high cortisol higher than average cortisol a high risk of having lower than average T3 and a higher risk of having a higher than average reverse T3. And so with that combination, I was and then listening to them and saying, you know, did these symptoms start after a stressful period in, in your life? Yes, they absolutely did. Do you feel cold? Yes, I do. You know, all of that kind of stuff. It was like, okay, this is pretty obvious. But I wouldn't have even perhaps thought, because there's loads of different things it, it could be for people, right? It could be this, could be that. So I might not have even thought of that if it weren't for the genetic report. So while the genetic reports are never diagnostic, they can, you know, if you know how to read them, really point you in the right direction. So again, I would recommend um, our genetic insights, either the limitless package where you have access to all, you know, over 500 reports, or if you're really interested in this hormonal issue specifically, I mean, this is probably a controversial thing, but I'd say probably our hormonal reports are the most helpful of all, the hormonal collection. And I think, you know, it's very affordable. I think it's 55 or $65, dollars, something like that. Plus you can get 25, 25, 20, 20% off by using the code uh, rejuvenate, um, you know, from this podcast. So that can be a really interesting starting place. And of course, it could be thyroid, often the root causes are thyroid, but it could be other things. It could be cortisol, could be oxytocin, could be GABA, could be testosterone, could be estrogen, could be progesterone. It could be a lot of different things. And so it's really helpful to 
do those tests to give you kind of a starting place. Beautiful, Owen. Yeah, always very poignant. And, you know, the genetic reports are a good investment and we continue to keep updating them, et cetera. So all those things. So it's a really good point. And, and everyone, again, always thank you for joining us. You know, we know your time is valuable and that's why we want to bring you valuable information that is really going to impact and improve and help you optimize your life. So always thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I recommend is just here, if you wanna click there, or another one I recommend is just below, if you wanna click on that one and watch that next.